Hey everybody, this is Darwin Reynon, the Festival Director of Hospitalejo Rega International Film Festival. And today I have a great guest. It's a great filmmaker who make a very impressive movie. We love it. Actually, uh, we have Justin who made the honor among peeps and that film is in our festival. We're very proud to have you. How are you, Justin? I'm doing well, how are you? Good, good, Justin. It's very, it's an honor to have you. Uh, Justin, let's start with the story. Who came up with the with the idea and the script? How 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 that work? It was you who wrote it. Yep, I I wrote the scripts. I I directed the movie. I was the cinematographer, and I invented the light that we used to actually light the film. Wow. So where do you get the idea? I'm on uh, owner. I'm on tips. Where did the idea coming from? Um, the the idea was actually very pragmatic. Uh, I had finished this lighting system called Anthem One. And uh, we were struggling to get people in Hollywood to take the light seriously. Uh, they just wouldn't even try it. And the light completely changes the nature of film production. So uh, I sat down with a couple of my friends and, and, and said, look, we need to come up with a short film that demonstrates all of the possibilities of, of what you can do with Anthem One. So uh, we're gonna limit ourselves to the budget and crew size and schedule of a typical student film. Um, that means we gotta fit everything into two vans, that's it. We, we don't, we're not even gonna allow ourselves to have a three ton truck uh, or a five ton truck or anything like that. Uh, no generators, no cables, no support equipment for lighting. Um, uh, we have two nights to shoot the movie, that's it. And um, we're gonna have a 14 person crew. So it's gonna be just this small skeleton crew. Um, and to really make it difficult, let's shoot out in the middle of the desert, uh, in the middle of the night where there's no available light so that the only light that you see in the movie is what is coming out of uh, an Anthem One. Uh, and, wow. and from that, we then came up with a story that would, that would allow us to show all of that off. Wow, Justin, that sounds impressive. So how, a I guess you did a very good pre-production because the film, I mean, when the jurors say to me, oh, you have to watch this film. This film is like a Hollywood short film. You know, they told me that. Thank you very much. How was the pre-production for you? Do you do a long pre-production? You organize everything? It was long or short? Tell us a little bit. Oh, no, it was, uh, you know, the, the, we, we, I came up with the idea and pre-produced the movie in two weeks. I mean, the whole thing was just a two week period. It's. Um, I think I, I, I had a, a inkling of an idea uh, in December of uh, 2018, and then we, no, it'd have to be 2017, and then we shot it, we shot it the first week of February in 2018. And, um, and, and so we're talking, it, it, from, from the day that I sort of started thinking about it, to the day that we shot it was only four weeks. Well, uh, but the real pre-production was, was a two week period. I mean, it was incredibly fast. And, and part of the reason it goes fast is you, if, if you were limiting yourself to two nights and a very, very tiny crew in one location, mm -hmm. there's not a lot to pre-produce. Um, right. uh, so so that was, that's part of what made it go so darn, darn quick. Wow, wow, this is, I love those interviews because it's, I always hear something different for each. So the production was two nights, right? That That's you did the, the film. Correct. Um, how, what was the most difficult part of the production besides the dark in those two nights? What do you think it was the most challenging for you or it was that? Um, we had a couple things uh, that were a little bit challenging. Um, one was the cold. I mean, it was, it was probably 30 degrees. Wow. Uh, we were shooting it just outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico and um, uh, in February. And so it was really, really cold. And um, my cast in particular struggled with it. Um, the red-haired actor who, who uh, plays Sam Spurlock had a big, giant, huge buffalo hide coat. And so he, <laughs> he was warm. But the actor who right. played John Thurston um, uh, was really struggling. Um, with how cold it was. Um, the other thing that, that we dealt with that was a struggle is that the caretaker of the facility um, was corrupt and he kept cutting our hours back and demanding bribes. Oh. And so uh, we, we ended up paying his bribes 
and uh, he bribed us for about, boy, $500, $1,000. I can't remember the exact amounts. Um, but the, his attitude was essentially like, you know, look, you're already shooting here. Now you're stuck. Uh, if you want access to this property tomorrow, I don't care what the owners of the property say. Um, you're going to be putting a couple hundred dollars cash in unmarked bills in my hand tomorrow. Oh my and so those, those sorts of things make um, production difficult as a small film. But the, the irony of this is the harder it was, the better it was because we were trying to prove that this little tiny light that, that I invented, Anthem One, um, made everything easy. And, and so the rest of the production was a, was a breeze. Like if you see our, our widest wide shots in the film, which are, you know, big, giant, huge Hollywood wide shots. Yeah, man, wow. Uh, I lit that in 15 minutes. Really? Yeah, and that's, that's and we pulled, uh, we only had four lights to light that shot. Uh, each light's only 200 watts. So we pulled 800 watts total uh, to light that wide shot. Our catering was pulling more electricity than the movie set was. And, wow. and so lighting, lighting was a breeze. And so if, and if you ever see some of our behind the scenes stills, you'll see only like five or six people walking around the set. Uh, so uh, in terms of the real movie making things, the, the things of like, how do we get a C stand over there? How do we get a light stand over there? How do I get a light up, you know, 30 feet in the air? All of that was easy. The, the part that's, that's <laughs> always gonna be hard is the human part. Humans are right. different. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow, Justin, that sounds amazing. Uh, how do you cast the, your actors? They are pretty good, I have to say well, that. Thank you very much. Um, yes. I'm lucky that I've got friends who are very good actors. Uh, so uh, uh, Jason Moore, who plays John Thurston, um, is one of my best friends and one of the investors mm -hmm. in the lighting system. And so it was really easy for me to get him. And, um, and then Michael Tabb, uh, who plays Sam Spurlock, um, is someone that I've known since my sophomore year at New York University's film school. And, uh, and so, so in that sense, we, we did not even have to hold casting for this movie. I just called Jason and uh, 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 Michael Tabb on the phone and said, hey, you guys want to be in a short film? I'm going to be shooting it in about four weeks. They said, okay, that, that was it. <laughs> wow. So. Nice. Uh, Justin, let's go to post-production. Who edited the film? You did as uh, well? I got really lucky as an editor. Uh, my editor makes me look like a much better filmmaker than I am. His name's Luis Cafisi. And uh, Luis is um, an editor and cinematographer for Robert Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, I talked him into editing the movie. And uh, he did it in his... Uh, spare time because his day job is is working at Troublemaker Studios in Austin, Texas, um, and, uh, and in the evenings he'd work on my short film. And uh, mm -hmm. God, he's a good editor. I mean, he just knows how to get <laughs> each moment. And, and and the big thing that I was pushing him about was something that um, we both had felt for a while, um, which is um, earning the moment. And what we mean by this is uh, if you look at older cinema not and, and we're not even talking classic hollywood not, not stuff from like say the 30s or the 40s or the 50s but take um a movie like um the empire strikes back from 1982 um mm -hmm. and you have that moment where um luke skywalker is trying to lift the x-wing out of the swamp and fails to do so because of his lack of belief and that moment takes maybe 30 seconds of screen time and uh, you compare that to a similar moment in, say, Marvel's The Ant-Man. And uh, the first Ant-Man movie, um, Ant-Man tries to control a, 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 an ant for the first time and fails to do so for his lack of belief. Structurally very similar moments. Um, and in the Ant-Man film, um, it takes maybe four seconds. It's so fast. It's cut so short and so tight. It's mm -hmm. over. And you understand it, but you don't feel it emotionally. You don't earn that sense of failure. And, um, and so, so one of the things we had talked about when we edited this movie 
is that there were going to be a couple moments that were edited much more like an older film. And I wanted to see, well, how long can we edit that moment and, and elongate that moment so that the audience really feels it? And, and what's funny is without music, it's boring. It's so, so editing that way without music is ineffective. You've got to have a score and you have to trust that your composer will bring such a good score to the film that, that it will no longer be boring. This is interesting because you're working with a very good editor. Uh, so when you give the footage to him, you know, all the materials and when he made the, the first assembly, the first cut, do you, do you like it right away? What he did for you or you start giving um, opinions and let's do this and let's do that. Or you really was into his vision or both were together. How was that connection? Well, I think it's both at the same time. And, um, Normally, I storyboard a movie thoroughly. This was not a, uh, this is the first time I've never storyboarded a film. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and when I storyboard a film, that usually means I have a very specific idea in mind of how it's supposed to be edited. Um, this was shot uh, with much more like classical Hollywood coverage, where we would shoot the entire short film from one angle, and then shoot the entire short film from another angle. So the editor could go into any moment and it would cut together. Um, and he could cut back and forth to the, the extreme wide shot to close-ups with ease. And that, that really does give an editor a lot more um, freedom. So, um, but Luis is so, such, a, such a skilled storyteller mm -hmm. uh, that I immediately loved what he did with the first cut. Um, but I did immediately have notes, I always do. And, and one of the reasons I don't edit my own movies is for this reason, I, I want to, have the objectivity of the audience. And so, you know, using the software is a piece of cake. It's not like digital editing software is difficult to use. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I find that if you're an editor, very quickly you, you get so lost in the edit and you're obsessing over uh, eliminating jump cuts and making sure that the motion is seamless and cutting on action and, and getting all of these little things done just right that you can't necessarily see, does the scene work? You guys made a right decision because you guys been in many festivals now, right? So many festivals, Eight you guys one. been around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're um, our 81st film festival. So, wow. uh, and thank you, by the way. Thank you very much. No, no, I mean, I mean, it's well deserved, Justin, and you know it. Uh, Justin, this is interesting now that you have this great uh, editor. How do you guys decide the final product? Do you get feedback from people, you show it, or you go with your intuition and you decide that you like it, what you see it? How does for you work, especially in this project, I'm owner among thieves? Well, mostly intuition. Um, so there's um, a great book by Stephen King called On Writing, and it's about his writing process. And I think right. that it applies to all art. And um, the worst thing that you can do with any piece of art is allow the wrong people to influence uh, your choices. They don't necessarily have the same vision that you do. Um, uh, they may not have the same beliefs that, that, that you have. And, and what you want is you want to make sure that you're not the only person in the room. That's dangerous because um, it's easy to fall in love with your own choices. And you've got to make sure that the people who are allowed to critique the work um, have been given the power to be honest. They've got to, mm -hmm. to be able to bluntly say, oh, I don't like that. That doesn't work. And if you don't have thick enough skin to handle that, um, that's a problem. But you don't want so many people that uh, it becomes chaos. And so I have a very, very small circle, uh, which of course includes the editor and it includes my wife um, and it includes... Uh, two or three other people that, that uh, most people don't necessarily know are, are looking at my stuff. And, and when it gets to about the third or fourth cut of a film, at the point where I know that it's working, um, that's usually when I allow this small circle of people, about four people, uh, to look at it. And they know their job is to be honest. And it's, mm -hmm. their job is not to say, I'm great. Um, we, we know that, that if... Uh, the second one happened, I'm like, you know, great. If you tell me I'm great um, and they won't know that, that we had work to do to make it better. Um, but that's, that's about as big as my, my core team ever gets. And 
Um, and they're all dedicated to just making the story as honest as possible. And that's, that's, it's funny that every single one of those people's never been coached, but they will often say the same things and they're watching it on their computers separately. And they'll always say that moment didn't strike me as authentic. That moment needed a bit more work, or is that the best take of that actor? Uh, because the moment wasn't honest and there's this obsession with honesty. And, and I think what we all agree is, if the movie's honest, the movie's good. And it's not any more complicated than that. Every single time uh, a, a, a moment in a movie is artificial and fake and forced, it sucks. If the performance is fake and forced, it sucks. If it's authentic, whether that's an uncomfortable truth or something that's hysterically funny, as long as it's honest, it works. And, and that's, that's how, that's all we're ever really talking about when we're editing a movie. Wow, wow, I'm learning a lot from you, Justin. Thanks for, for all these uh, uh, words. I got two more questions for you. Uh, you are okay. well, well prepared um, filmmaker, I can see that. What is the difficult fa uh, pace in the filmmaking process? The pre-production, production, or post-production, they're all difficult, we know that, right. but which one for you is the most chaotic, difficult of the three phases? For me, the, the part that I enjoy the least and is the most mm -hmm. difficult is production. Um, and that's the opposite of almost everyone that I know. I, I, most people love production and they hate pre-production and post-production. And I love pre-production and post-production. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think part of it is that I'm autistic. And as an autistic person, sometimes I struggle to communicate with people. And you know, particularly if they're not people that I know very well, um, I can accidentally rub them the wrong way. And it's not intentional, but people who don't understand autism might misinterpret me and say, God, that guy's being an asshole. God, he's being, he's so opinionated. He's so forceful. And so, so I, I find production to be the least enjoyable for that reason. Um, what I like about pre-production is it's usually two or three people that I know very, very well. And, uh, and if I'm, when I get in the zone, uh, a lot of the softening language that Americans require, uh, and I think it's a uniquely American problem. And in America, you, you, you can never say that sucks. Um, it's always gonna be, you're brilliant, you're absolutely brilliant, but I'm not sure, maybe that could be a little bit better. And there's all this additional bullshit that gets added to it um, and, and my brain just doesn't work that way so so if I'm working with a storyboard artist who the storyboard artist knows I love them I respect them I think they're intelligent I think they're talented and and but we're in that zone and I'm like oh boy I, that, just, that just sucks what we do and they don't take it personally they know it's not intended to be a slight against their intelligence and, and we get through the work much, much faster, and I enjoy that. Um, and the same in post. Um, my colorist is a phenomenal colorist. Has worked with directors way bigger than me. I'm, a, I'm just a little guy in Wisconsin. Um, but I'll be able to say, oh, that shot's just way too dark. I don't like that. Can we try something different? And my colorist doesn't uh, get offended by that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess I just haven't ha yet had enough uh, crew that I use uh, on multiple projects to get to a point where the crew realizes that that I respect them even if I'm like trying to hurry and trying to get it done um, and uh, so so there you go so I'm, I'm not a big fan of production yeah I'm, I'm agree with you I is the most difficult for me is production definitely so many pieces that you need to put together at the same time yeah hey, yeah my other question uh, Justin is uh, I mean like I said again, you're a great filmmaker. There is no doubt about that. Uh, what did you learn in this film, Honor Among Thieves, that you will do different in the next film? Is there any ed educational that you can tell us? So um, that actually gets to the core of a philosophy I've had since I first started making movies, which is uh, the way that I made myself a better filmmaker um, is that every single time I finished a movie, uh, for about the first two weeks, I'd pat myself on the back. Oh, I'm talented. Oh, I'm really good. Um, and then after about two weeks, I'd get realistic. And I'd go, okay, what's one thing I can do different? And that requires a level of honesty that a lot of people struggle with. And, um, uh, and so the, the, the number one thing that, that 
I would do differently. And, and it's usually little things. It's, it, it, you know, it's not big things. It's not, oh, I'd have a bigger budget. Well, that, that's, that's, not, mm-hmm. that's not you, you know, or, oh, I'd make sure I have five more days to shoot the movie. You know, it's, it's really specific artistic choices. And one of the things that I learned in making this film, particularly for comedy, is that um, reaction shots should have no emotion. And then it's comfortable holding them. So there are times where uh, John Thurston is pulling all the ridiculous gadgets out of his jacket. And um, the moment was actually inspired from a scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I wanted to have the kind of reaction shots that are in this scene where this economics professor saying, Bueller, Bueller, and, and you'd cut to the um, students in the classroom and the students are just like that. And it's hysterical. And it turns out what makes it hysterical is that the audience can overlay whatever emotion they want onto the reaction. The reaction is actually almost blank. And you see anger, or you see boredom, or you see disgust, and it's not telecast so obviously. Um, and, it's, and, and you need to hold that reaction shot a lot longer than you'd think. Um, and I didn't do that on Honor Among Thieves. And it actually made that one of the more difficult editing things is that the moments were two seconds long when they should have been four seconds long. And so the next movie, one of the things I'm definitely going to do anytime I'm doing a reaction shot, um, whether it's dramatic act reaction shot or a comedic reaction shot, is I'm, I'm going to be saying to the actor, do less, do it longer. And I think if I just do that, that will make a better movie. Wow. That's a great tip. Impressive. Hey, Justin, I, are you coming to Barcelona? What do you think? I would love to come to Barcelona. It would be a joy. and I'd actually love to come to your festival. Nice, hey, Justin. We'll be very happy if you can make it. Hey, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to have your film in our festival. It's a great film, like I told you. And, thank you very much. And congratulations on your nominations and, yeah, everything. And, yeah, yeah, we're really happy to have your film. Okay, Justin? Thank you very much. Have a good day, sir. Thank you for sharing all this experience with us. All right, Jesse? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.